All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. And we are so, so thankful to have you here to join the McGovern Center for the annual McGovern Civic Engagement Forum. I'm Carly Hubers, and I'm the program coordinator for the McGovern Center here at Dakota Wesleyan. And I'd also like to recognize Dr. Alicia Vincent. She's the director for the McGovern Center. There she is, waving in the back. Um, the, just to give you all a little background, the McGovern Civic Engagement Forum is and has always been an educational forum. It's a place where we hope to carry on a small part of the legacy of Senator George McGovern and his commitment to civic and engaging dialogue despite sometimes difficult topics. But this year we are happy and thrilled to welcome Dr. Mary Hess as our keynote speaker. Dr. Hess's address and yes, I know that rhymed, I was playing with words there. <laughs> we'll be followed today by a panel discussion, and that panel is made up of some community and state leaders. Um, Dr. Amy Novak, our campus president, Major Michael Coster, and Mr. J.R. LaPlante as well. The panel will be facilitated by some of our very own student leaders, and they will be doing their best to keep time in that small portion of the panel portion of the evening. And although there is a very short time for the panel portion of the evening, as you may have noticed in the back there, there are tables with note cards, and Alicia will hold one up there, um, and pens in the aisles for you to write down any questions that you may have had coming in, but also as you hear Dr. Hess give her um, address, if there's any question you have or something you'd be interested to hear the panel talk about, feel free to stand up and scoot to the back and write down your question and put it in the bowl next to it. Um, and then Alicia, when it's time for our panel to come up, we'll read through the questions and pick out a few if we have time at the end of the panel to take some audience questions from the cards. And we would love for you to participate in this way. And now we would like to welcome Dr. Mary Hess. Uh, Mary Hess is a professor of educational leadership at Luther Seminary, where she's taught since the year 2000. But during this academic year, 2016-2017, she holds the Patrick and Barbara Keenan Visiting Chair in Religious Education at St. Michael's College at the University of Toronto. Uh, Mary has degrees from Yale, Harvard, and Boston College and has directed a number of projects focused on media culture, especially for communities of faith. She has some publication and writing on theological education, on dismantling racism, and again with media. And she has spent much of the day today with our students and faculty, which has been really fun and engaging to see her do today. And of course, we are so excited to have her here with us tonight. So with me, would you please welcome Dr. Mary Hess to the stage. So lovely to be here. I'm really appreciative of the invitation and that this community is interested in engaging this topic. I thought I might start by saying a little something about what I know about growing up in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, which at the time I was growing up had about 20,000 people in it, which I think is not a whole lot more than are here in Mitchell. We moved there when I was five years old, and my mom still lives in the house, there's an image there, that I grew up in. I know that when I return to this community, when I return to the church that I grew up in, people still know me. The people who babysat me when I was little are that much older now, and some of the kids for whom I, in turn, babysat are now leaders in the community. But the stories I grew up within, and the stories to which, in turn, I helped to contribute, and really still tell, are a very crucial part of what keeps that community and so many small towns and rural communities alive and vibrant. But here's something else I know from growing up in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. I had no friends who were not white until I got to middle school. And even then, the one friend I had was from India. His parents were professors at our local college. Even in high school, there were very few people of color in my, at that time, quite large public school. And this meant that almost all that I knew about people of color, I learned from television. So here are some images of the popular culture I grew up within. I love popular media, but the older I grow, the more aware I am of how deceptive popular culture can be, and of how narrow the frame it puts around our own stories. 
of how many stories we never hear and how many stories we hear only through distorting lenses. It wasn't until I got to college and finally had the opportunity to build relationships with people quite different from myself that I was able to broaden the stories within which I lived. That I was finally able to hear the stories of people of color and to share my own stories of growing up. I'd like to pause for a moment here and invite all of you in silence to think for just maybe 30 seconds a bit about how you learned about race. What did that word, when did that word first become part of your own vocabulary? And what did it mean? Who taught it to you? And how have your perceptions of what it means changed over time? I'm going to give you just a little bit of silence to think about that now. And you might even want to jot some notes to yourself. Okay, as we explore this evening how to think about white privilege in small town and rural settings, I also want to note that I come at this from a specifically and deeply Christian perspective. I believe that God desires deeply for all of us to love one another, to embrace each other in the full and rich knowledge of our differences. Maybe you've seen this particular cartoon. Jesus takes a selfie. And if you look at the image, right, it's a very diverse image. But of course, Jesus never promised that such a road would be an easy one to take. I was reminded of this a couple weeks ago in liturgy when the text for the day included this admonition from Jesus. If anyone comes to me without hating his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. I'm not asking you to hate your family, <laughs> and I'm certain that that was not even the primary aim of Jesus' words on that occasion either. But I think it's important to recognize that loving each other in the midst of our deep differences is never going to be easy. It's a worthy goal, though, and one which I'm convinced God sends the Spirit into our lives to support. So how does thinking about race how does using a term like white privilege help us to do any of this? Isn't it sending us more deeply into our differences rather than helping us to bridge them? And maybe that's the point, that loving each other requires seeing our difference rather than pretending it doesn't exist. One of the more famous of Martin Luther King Jr.'s quotations goes something like this. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I grew up with that quote, and thinking that that quote meant that skin color was, as some would say, irrelevant, that what I should do was not see it, that the goal was to become, if you will, colorblind. But the problem with that goal is that we are not colorblind with regard to race. Indeed, we not only see it, but we use it, often implicitly, without conscious thought to structure how we interact with each other. I really don't have time to go into this particular image, but this is an image of various ways in which cognitive bias works. I urge you to type that into Google someday and do a search for thinking about how implicit bias is part of how we think about race. But to get back to the notion of white privilege, is it a concept that can help us move forward in any way? Here's how Jennifer Holliday puts it. White skin privilege is not something that white people necessarily do, create, or even enjoy on purpose. Unlike the more, more overt individual and institutional manifestations of racism, white skin privilege is a transparent preference for whiteness that saturates our society. White skin privilege serves several functions. First, it provides white people with perks that we do not earn and that people of color do not enjoy. 
Second, it creates real advantages for us. White people are immune to a lot of challenges. And finally, white privilege shapes the world in which we live, the way that we navigate and interact with one another and with the world. So white skin privilege is a transparent preference for whiteness that saturates our society. Let's take each piece of her definition and think about it. White privilege provides white people with perks that we do not earn and that people of color do not enjoy. There's a very famous essay published years ago by a scholar named Peggy McIntosh who created a list of such perks that she called the invisible backpack. I remember reading that list in college and thinking about my own version. For instance, I can ignore conversations about race. I can expect law enforcement to assume good things about me. Or very trivial, when I go to Target to buy shampoo, I can expect the kinds that I like will be in the section marked shampoo rather than in ethnic care products. When I walk into a shopping mall, I can expect to find people who have the same color as, skin color as I do, and I don't expect to be judged solely by that element of who I am. When I look at the syllabus in a class on theology, I can expect most of the readings to be by white people, and any that are not probably fall under the category of uh, liberation theology or womanist theology or enculturation. Basically, being white becomes normalized, something which is the expectation, so that if you are not white, if you do not look white, then you are marked as different. For those of us who are white, we don't even notice this. In fact, I think our society sets us up deliberately not to notice. And that means that when someone calls our attention to it, we might feel shame or guilt for participating and shame for not noticing, both of which can contribute to continuing not to want to notice. Kind of a difficult conundrum. Difference by itself could be a great thing. God creates us in difference. But difference, which uses power to impose advantage and disadvantage, is not. Who gets to choose, for instance, which differences matter and how to speak about them? Consider this ad. Throughout tonight, by the way, I'm going to show you a number of short videos. And you got a handout when you came in, or at least I think you did. And on that handout are both, there's a link to these slides. So all of these slides are already available online. And at the end of the slides, there are links to all of the videos which are all free and available online. So give yourself room to just experience them. You can go back and look at them later. So here's the first one. Consider this ad. Proud, forgotten, Indian, Navajo, Blackfoot, Inuit, and Sioux, survivor, spiritualist, patriot, Sitting Bull, Hiawatha, and Jim Thorpe, mother, father, son, daughter, chief, Apache, Pueblo, Choctaw, Chippewa, and Crow, underserved, struggling, resilient, Squanto, Red Cloud, Tecumseh, and Crazy Horse, Rancher, Teacher, Doctor, Soldier, Seminole, Seneca, So what's the difference between a name and a label? Think about that for a moment. 
the difference between a name and a label. The second element Holiday notes is that white privilege creates real advantages for white people for us. White people are immune to a lot of challenges. Well, being different is a fine thing, but what if we use that difference to discriminate in ways that advantage some and disadvantage others? Consider this video. Oh, hey, I didn't see you there. So if you're like most Americans, you probably say to yourself all the time, systemic racism, is that really a thing? Did you know that in 2010, black Americans made up 13% of the population, but only had 2.7% of the country's wealth? That the median net worth for a white family was $134,000, but the median net worth for a Hispanic family was $14,000, and for black Americans, it was $11,000? Know that the median wealth for a single white woman has been measured at $41,000, but for a Hispanic woman it was $140, and for a black woman $120. Did you know that? Do you know what that's called? That's called systemic racism. And yes, it's really a thing. So I want to let those statistics sink in for a minute and to remind you that part of what racism, visit. part of what he's talking about are percentages of a population compared to other percentages. Here are some slides um, from South Dakota. This is based on the 2010 census, these slides. So here are incarceration rates in 2010. You can see percentages of the population. I find this one even more interesting. So the total population in South Dakota of blacks, right, is roughly, what is that, 1%? And in the incarcerated population is 8%. Or American Indians and Alaskan Natives, those are labels from the census, of course. Again, gaps between the representation of the population and the representation in incarceration. Here's a, a thing I thought was very interesting. Let me see if I can get the link to work. Um, this is 2016 data. And this compares incarceration rates Where's my, here we go. Uh, if, if, the United, if states in the United States were countries, so compared to countries. So if, uh, interestingly enough, look at where South Dakota is, which I think is particularly fascinating given where North Dakota is, right? But <laughs> District of Columbia, Louisiana, Georgia, and you have to go all the way down. Oops, let's see. Turkmenistan shows up right here. El Salvador, Cuba. Now, the, the thing about incarceration rates is that I think people are starting to wake up and recognize that something is going on, that it's a complicated issue, and that we need to deal with it. And in South Dakota, there have been groups working on it for a while now. And this is a graph just from 2016, and the link, anything underlined, by the way, in the slides is a link that can take you to these citations. You'll notice that, that South Dakota judges are starting to use probation more frequently, which is, of course, a way to not have people be incarcerated, particularly for nonviolent kinds of offenses. And you can see how the trend lines are moving there. I think it's very important to note that you have folks in South Dakota working on this, because I think it's really important to recognize that these differing empirical numbers actually matter Right, and they aren't necessarily about what we think we're intentionally doing. We think we're intentionally making the world, whatever, a safer place. But in the process, our implicit biases are shaping how that stuff becomes structured. The final thing that Halliday says is that white privilege shapes the world in which we live, the way that we navigate and interact with one another and with the world. And here's where I think we begin to see how white privilege intersects with and becomes a part of how we think about racism. Here are some definitions that get used a lot in the academy. Bigotry plus power equals racism as interpersonal practice. Because of course we all have prejudices. Every single one of us has a prejudice in varieties of ways. But not all of us are able to enforce that prejudice with power. This is the way I understood racism growing up. I understood that it was something where 
I should not say certain words. I should not interact with people in certain ways. I saw it as a very personal issue. And I knew that I couldn't possibly be racist because I didn't say those words and I, right? But what I didn't understand then, what it's taken me a long time to learn, is that racism actually also operates on these other two levels. So are there disparities that are created and, and or exacerbated by societal institutions? Racism as institutional practice. And then there's the normalization and legitimization that routinely confers advantages on whites while producing chronic adverse outcomes for others. This is the racism that becomes structural practice that has so permeated our society that white folk don't even see it. Race is a social construction, and the white privilege which is accrued through that social construct was created by human beings to enact power over other human beings. But that, of course, means that we can deconstruct it, and we can build something else. People who carry this privilege can use it to deconstruct the more problematic of these systems. We can break down barriers. We can build something better together. And there are things each of us can do. Knowing that your own story can be widened and made more authentic by honest conversation with someone else's is an incredibly wonderful gift. Brian Stevenson, who's a longtime advocate for justice, especially in the criminal justice system in the US, offers this advice on change. He suggests that there are four things we can do. We should get proximate. We should change the narratives. We should cultivate resilience through finding what gives us hope. And we need to embrace discomfort. I was transformed by my time in college. And you, those of you in the community who are students here and teachers, can be too. And more than anything, I would urge you to get proximate and start listening. Really listen. Don't assume that you know more than someone else. In fact, you could start by assuming that you know less. And you could assume that if you open yourself up to listening, you will experience learning. Listen, really listen. The second challenge, as Stevenson puts it, is to change the narratives. And we need to do that not only by including more stories in what we're listening to and hearing, but also by recognizing that some of our narratives intentionally filter out stories that we need to remember, we need to hear. Serene Jones, who's the president of a seminary in New York City, recently wrote an essay about our national narratives that was in Time Magazine. This is what she wrote. It's a long quote, so I'm going to read the whole thing. As Americans, we have a theological national story we tell about our country. It begins with the Constitution, and it typically describes the constant progress that good people have made since the start. It's a relentlessly positive story. From a spiritual perspective, the problem is that this story has not incorporated a serious account of our wrongs. The clearest example of this is our failure to sufficiently deal with our two most obviously horrific wrongs, the carefully orchestrated genocide of Native Americans and the 300-year-long story of the most brutal social system ever created, chattel slavery. Why is this absence a spiritual problem? There's no religious or spiritual tradition, at least any worth its salt, that does not begin with a serious account of both the good and the bad that people can do. There are many names for the negative side of human existence, such as sin, evil, illusion, moral absence, inequity, transgression, negative karma. All recognize that human beings alone and collectively can do really bad things. This doesn't mean we don't have a good side, but these stories insist that if we do not existentially reckon with the ugly side of our beliefs and actions, we will not have healthy communities. Egregious harms will continue to unfold and profound despair and alienation inevitably set in. Why? Because deep down we're living a spiritual lie. We need to learn our histories. 
And not just the upbeat, cheerful narratives, although those matter too, but also the ones which bring us to tears and which invite us to pray. In amongst these stories will be stories of resistance to racism, stories that include white people resisting racism, and stories of people who join together to make a difference in their world. I have no doubt that George and Eleanor McGovern played a role in at least some of these stories. This center, which bears their name and legacy in this part of the world, surely will invite you, is inviting you right now, to broaden and deepen the stories that you know. Find ways to dig into history, and not just the endless lists of the kind of history I was subjected to in high school, the names of leaders and the dates of wars, but learn the history of social movements, the history that is made up of multiple stories of multiple people who have gone before us. Their stories matter, and their stories continue to shape us. Here's another video. One morning I woke up and I heard my brother crying. He was screaming so loud you thought someone was dying. Mom, Dad, he screamed, but there was no use trying. They weren't around. I ran outside and saw he'd had a pretty bad crash. His bike was in the ditch, down his arm a bloody gash. He looked so pitiful just sitting there in the dirt amongst the trash crying. I want mom and dad. I picked him up and started running toward my uncles up the way. It started raining and got real dark. He could barely tell it was day. My brother cried and asked, sister, where's mom? I didn't know what to say when the truth is, I don't know. When my uncle saw us coming, he ran into the yard. He took my brother from me and he held him in his arms. When he saw my face, I could tell. I could tell he was alarmed. And he said, what happened? Did you fall too? Uncle, I'm so tired, so tired of wondering why. Why do they drink? Why do they do drugs? Why do they leave us? Why? He said, sister, it's hard to explain. And I said, uncle, try. And then he told this story. Once this land was teepees as far as you can see. The water was clean, the land pristine. We were where we were meant to be. Then strangers came across the sea and brought with them their disease. Our people cried and prayed and sang, but it brought them to their knees. suddenly got sick and died. And before you even had a chance to bury them and mourn, the strangers came and took away the land where you were born. And you wondered if your parents even cared as they stole you and your brother away, or if they'd been so beaten down they had nothing left to say. And then at school, they cut your hair and beat you if you spoke. The language that Creator gave our people when Earth awoke. Sister, I'm not 
not trying to tell you that your mom and dad are okay or that they are not responsible for the choices that they've made. But you see this bloody wound on your little brother's arm. If we don't clean it, it won't heal and it'll do all kinds of harm. Those deep wounds of our ancestors still bleed within our hearts. When we remember all they've done, that's where the healing starts. So every morning when you wake, you pray this prayer out loud. Creator, help me live in a way that would make my ancestors proud. We will rise from the darkness. Don't you forget this. You can be anything you want to be. Perseverance is the key. For your spirits live Strength, dignity, honor, that's all in your family tree. So hold your head up high and know that. We need to start healing on a very deep level. And I'm convinced that the only way to do this is to listen, really listen, in accountable ways to each other. Some would say this is about becoming an ally. I happen to like how Francesca Ramsey puts it, that ally is a verb, so that we ally with someone. We join in a movement. And she's offered some lovely advice so another video. Hey friends. So I'm trying something different with my setup and I don't know if it's working, but you will deal. <laughs> Imagine your friend is building a house and they ask you to help, but you've never built a house before. So it'd probably be a good idea for you to put on some productive gear and listen to the person in charge. Otherwise, someone's gonna get seriously hurt. Look, I'm helping. It's the exact same idea when it comes to being an ally. An ally is a person that wants to fight for the equality of a marginalized group that they're not a part of. We need your help building this house, but you probably should listen so you know what to do first. Let's do this. So here are my five tips for being a good ally. Understand your privilege. Now a lot of people get hung up on the word privilege, so let me break it down for you nice and easy. Privilege does not mean that you are rich, that you've had an easy life, that everything's been handed to you and you've never had to struggle or work hard. All it means is that there are some things in life that you will not experience or ever have to think about just because of who you are. It's kind of like those horses that have those blinders on. They can see just fine. There's just a whole bunch of stuff on the side that they don't even know exists. So for example, there are currently 29 states where you can legally be fired for being gay. And there are 34 states where you can legally be fired for being trans. Now as a straight cis woman, those are things that I don't have to ever think about if I don't want to. I'm not gonna be fired because I'm straight and I'm not gonna be fired because I'm cis. So so it makes sense that before I can fight for the rights of others, I have to understand what rights I have and others don't. That's privilege. Listen and do your homework. It sounds like a no-brainer, but it's not possible for you to learn if you aren't willing to listen. So you gotta know when to zip up the lipa. 
I don't know. You get what I mean. But that's the thing that's so cool about social media. There are so many people sharing their stories all around the world and connecting with people that they normally would never get a chance to without the power of the internet. So do your homework. Start reading blogs, tweets, news articles, and stories so that you can get caught up on the issues that are important to the communities that you want to support. Speak up but not over. If the fight for equality was a girl group, the ally wouldn't be the lead singer or the second lead singer. They'd be Michelle. An ally's job is to support. You want to make sure that you use your privilege and your voice to educate others, but make sure to do it in such a way that does not speak over the community members that you're trying to support or take credit for things that they are already saying. This isn't Mario Kart. Stay in your lane. Realize that you're going to make mistakes and apologize when you do. Nobody's perfect. Unlearning problematic things takes time and work, so you are bound to mess up and trip and fall. No oh God. But don't worry, you can brush yourself off and get right back up. I'm back up! Just remember that it's not about your intent, it's about your impact. So when you get called out, make sure to listen, apologize, commit to changing your behavior, and move forward. Last, but certainly not least, Actually, the most important thing on this list is remember that ally is a verb. Saying you're an ally is not enough. You gotta do the work. One through four, one through four. As always, there are links in the video description box to some of the things I mentioned in this video, along with some resources that have been really helpful for me as I've gone along in my journey to be more conscious. So I wanna hear from you in the comments. What are some sites that you suggest checking out? And what are some things that have helped you become a better ally? Let me know in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you when I see you. Bye. So here's the thing about social media. There, I handed out it on that same little piece that has both the links to this presentation, so all the embedded videos. There are also some places to go to start doing that learning. And you might be surprised that one of the places I would recommend is called MTV Decoded, which is full of short videos much like this that give very good historical and uh, advocacy-related context to a whole bunch of things that we're experiencing around race right now. There are also a lot of other kinds of resources on that handout, and I commend them to you. But back to Brian Stevenson's advice. Get proximate, change the narratives. And then his third, cultivate hope, or cultivate resilience, rather, through hope, right? And finding what gives you hope gives you resilience. For me, that's my faith. But it is also art and music and poetry, and even in the midst of commercial popular culture, moments which spring up and invite me into that hope. For instance, here's a commercial, another video, that aired during the Olympics just a couple weeks ago. I note the obvious differences in the human family. Some of us are serious. Some thrive on comedy. I've sailed upon the seven seas and stopped in every land. I've seen the wonders of the world, not yet one common man. I know 10,000 women called Jane and Mary Jane. I've not seen any two who really were the same. Mirror twins are different, although their features jive, and lovers think quite different thoughts while lying side by side. I note the obvious differences between each sort and type, but we are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. We are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. So that's a commercial, right? But it's a poem by Maya Angelou, and she's in fact the person who was reading. It's a recording of her reading part of her poem. That poem is actually longer than that. Brian Stevenson's final point has to do with embracing discomfort. And you may remember that I started here talking about Jesus' call to pick up the cross and keep moving. Even if you're not somebody who finds hope in Christian community, or for that matter, any religion, I hope that you might consider that healing begins by acknowledging that pain is a symptom of something that is not yet whole, or something that needs to return to wholeness and health. This is where the Black Lives Matter movement is so important for all of us. We have to see what is happening 
We have to acknowledge pain and injustice. We have to respect each other if we are ever to really heal the deep wounds of this nation. And that work begins at home for each of us and is something each of us can do, even in the whitest of communities, by reaching out to listen, to extend respect, to embrace that pain, that anger and guilt. These are emotions which can point to injustice. Embrace them and seek to understand what led to them and what might be leading you and others around you beyond them. That handout, right, that I've given you has a number of places from which to start, and I'm sure that the McGovern Center and the leaders here in town who we're about to hear from will have all sorts of very strong and good ways to dig in and do this work. But I would offer you just from my own experience that white privilege is a really great place to start. Let it open you up to relationship. Recognize how it's closed you off from relationship. Recognize how it's taken you into some narrow stories rather than broader, more vibrant stories. Listen to the wider, broader community of stories around you. And then together, together, we can do this work. We can dismantle racism. We can build a community that's stronger and healthier together. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hess, for your words. Um, at this time, I want to um, first encourage anyone in the audience who was interested in writing down a question to, again, feel free to do that at one of the back tables there. Um, but I would also like to invite our panel members as well as our panel facilitators to come up and take their place. Um, as they're coming up, I'll introduce them to you all so you kind of have an understanding of who they are and their background. We have, of course, our keynote for the evening, Dr. Mary Hess. We also have Dr. Amy Novak, our president here at Dakota Wesleyan University. Dr. Amy Novak became our president in 2013, but before this, Dr. Novak served as provost and executive vice president in many other positions at Dakota Wesleyan since 2003. Dr. Novak is a native South Dakotan and a graduate of Mitchell High School, and she also has degrees from University of Notre Dame, from Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio, and Creighton University in Omaha. We're thrilled to have her join us today. Next, we have Major Michael Coster, the Assistant Chief of Police at the Mitchell Police Division. Major Coster is also a native of Mitchell and has been employed with the Mitchell Police Division since 2000. His responsibilities include supervising the day-to-day -day operations of the Police Division, and we are incredibly thankful for him to take some time to be here with us today. And next, we have Mr. Leroy J.R. LaPlante, Mr. LaPlante is the Director of Tribal Relations for the Avera Health System and serves as a liaison between Avera and the tribal nations and entities within the organization's service area. Mr. LaPlante holds degrees from Carson Newman College in Tennessee and from the University of South Dakota School of Law in Vermilion. Mr. LaPlante is an enrolled member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe in South Dakota has more than six years of legal experience and has served as both the Crow Creek Sioux Tribe Chief Judge and Court Administrator, that was a long one, <laughs> as well as served as the first South Dakota Department of Tribal Relations Cabinet Secretary. And we are excited to have him with us here tonight as well. Let's give a warm welcome to all of our panelists. And before we begin, I also want to take a quick moment to introduce our panel moderators for the evening. We have Cece Schneider there on the other side. She's a junior and double majoring in psychology and nonprofit administration. She's also the president of the McGovern Engagement Student Group. Nathan Bader is a freshman this year and a double major in history and nonprofit administration. He is also this year's McGovern Scholar student. So thank you to Nathan and Cece for being with us here today and taking some time. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Cece and we can start this conversation together. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hess, for your wonderful introduction. We got to hear a lot about <clears throat> your experiences of coming to understand race and racial privilege, but we'd like to hear from some of the other individuals. Um, how did you first come to understand race and what helped inform those understandings for you? Uh, Dr. Novak, would you like to start?
Thanks, Cece. Um, just thank you just so much for our panelists who are here this evening. I think it's a really important conversation for our community to be having. And um, it's a privilege to just be in conversation in community. And that's one of the great, I think, opportunities presented in a university um, such as Dakota Wesleyan. Like yourself, I grew up in a, um, in a community that was quite white and um, did not have um, an, a real notion of white privilege and probably didn't have a lot of exposure to people of color. Um, there was some diversity in my extended family and so there was an opportunity to hear their stories and understand and appreciate their context. But certainly when I got to college, um, that opened up the door and the roommate right next to me um, during my freshman year happened to be um, actually from Africa but had lived in the Boston area for um, upwards of 10 years of the, la the last 10 years of her, of her life. And she just began conversations in a way that I had not thought about. And I think it was the first time that I really began to think introspectively about perhaps many of the assumptions that I had made about race and who I was that I took for granted that she wasn't able to. And so that was very pivotal to me um, as I grew and developed. I also had a wonderful opportunity um, to spend some time abroad as well and was in India and had my eyes opened to um, even degrees of privilege within the caste system of India and looking at the spectrum of race and how it shapes the world globally, not just in America, but um, certainly all around us. And obviously, um, for many of you who know me, Ken and I are parents to two, to eight children, two of whom are uh, African American. And for us, um, that has been a new lens, and one in which we have learned so much from them. And so it's a privilege each and every day to think about how they have helped us relook at the world and what race means. Thank you, Amy Novak. Uh, Mr. Costner, would you like to tell us how you first came to understand race and what helped inform those understandings for you? Again, like the two prior to me, uh, I grew up here in Mitchell. Uh, most of you being in school here, you know, the, the very small community in, in the you know greater sense. Um, I remember as a, as a child going to grade school, uh, having a friend of color, and seeing how the children interacted with them was kind of my first experience with it and not understanding why some of the other children you know even at that young age in the second grade interacted with that that other child and not understanding it and you know throughout my life looking back at that thinking what a shame that was um, one of my best friends at that age um, you know throughout my educational experience having other friends of color and hearing their stories of you know where they had come from how they had been treated what types of things they had to endure simply based upon being a person of color um, that extended into my my career in law enforcement here you you interact with a variety of people throughout your career in law enforcement and, and hearing their stories and sometimes interacting with them and finding that they have expectations of how they were going to be treated and relieved to find out that in a community of 15,000 people that they, that they weren't going to be treated in a disrespectful way. Uh, I find that refreshing for, you know, as a law enforcement officer in this community to see that they cannot have those bad experiences, you know, in, in this community. Thank you. Uh, Mr. LaPlante, would you like to tell us how you first came to understand race and what helped inform those understandings for you? Be glad to. Thanks, Cece. And thanks to Dakota Wesleyan for sponsoring this panel and this discussion. Um, <clears throat> as the former uh, Secretary of Tribal Relations uh, for the state of South Dakota, I, I really promoted dialogue and I tried to create as much opportunity for dialogue in our communities around the state on race and on pivotal issues to help us move forward. And so uh, I, I applaud the university and uh, the student body for, for putting this event on. Um, I didn't grow up in Mitchell. <laughs> I grew up in a little town just about 90 miles north of Pierre, South Dakota,
called Eagle Butte, South Dakota, within the exterior boundaries of the Cheyenne River Sioux Indian Reservation. Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe is one of 562 federally recognized tribes in our country. We have a land base of over one, over probably about 2.3 million acres of land, roughly the size of the state of Connecticut. Our reservation uh, boundaries uh, stretch from Faith, South Dakota, all the way to the uh, western uh, uh, shore of the Missouri River along Highway 212, and then from Timberlake, South Dakota, all the way down uh, to the Cheyenne River. Um, we have about uh, 12 to 15,000 tribal citizens that live on our reservation. Um, you know, we talk about lenses, and there's been a couple uh, mentions about lenses. It's so important when you look at the issue of race, you have to look at it, at least for a Native American. Um, I think that's the question. How did I become, uh, how did race impact me? What's my understanding? My understanding of race is, is, in order to really be informed as a Native American about race, I have to look at it from a number of different angles. Uh, for me, it, it wasn't just about skin color. Um, um, and, and my understanding of race really started when I was a little boy, and, and I think I'm still, still learning what, what race means to me as a Native American. Because um, for me, um, Native Americans, I'm just not a, a person of color. Um, I have to look at it from a historical lens, as you saw from the video. I also have to look at it from a legal perspective in terms of the way the United States government, the way the state of South Dakota, the way Dewey and Zeba County, the way the city of Eagle Butte treated me because they treated me the way I would, they treated me and my family and other Native Americans on the reservation, they treated me that way because, not only because we were a race, but because we were, we were politically affiliated to the Cheyenne River Sioux tribe. And because of that political affiliation, because I was a citizen of that tribal nation, I was treated differently. And in many cases, I was treated badly simply because I was a citizen of the Cheyenne River Sioux tribe. But no fault of my own. I was born into that citizenry. So I was not only born into a tribal citizenship, but I was also born into a race, depending on the context. So for me, my understanding is still evolving. But early on, uh, race as we understand it, uh, I guess I think generally that it's uh, creed, color, uh, ethnicity, I guess from that lens, from that experience, my first understanding of it was, you know, you got to understand, growing up on the Indian Reservation, Cheyenne River, um, Cheyenne River was first established after the United States government breached its first treaty with the Great Sioux Nation. And all of the land that is now current day western South Dakota was ceded uh, to the United States government, which eventually became the state of South Dakota for peace. And it was a peace treaty that was struck in 1871. And after 1871, the great Lakota reservation was broken up into four smaller reservations. Rosebud, which is current day Rosebud Sioux Indian Reservation, Pine Ridge, Standing Rock, and Cheyenne River. And the seven bands of the Lakota Oyate were split up as well. But on Cheyenne River, uh, once those smaller reservations were created, um, something else happened. The South, South Dakota became a state, partly because of, why, because of the great land session of the Sioux Nation. And when South Dakota became a state, what happened as a result of that was um, uh, the United States government continued to, to open up our tribal territories. And so then they passed the General Allotment Act. The General Allotment Act is one of the most devastating federal laws to ever be passed uh, because it had an adverse effect upon our tribal nations and still does to this day. Because after the General Allotment Act was passed, the Homestead Act was passed. So not only did they put us on these smaller Indian reservations, they opened up those reservations 
to, uh, while well, they actually allotted those lands on those reservations to individual Indians and families to turn us into farmers, which we weren't. We were, we were hunters and gatherers. So we were given a plow, and we were given a cow, and we were given a horse, and we were given a wagon. We were expected to become farmers with no experience at all, with no ancestry, with no experience at all of, of, of being farmers. Of course, we ultimately failed, and when we failed, we lost our land, and the land was then bought because we couldn't pay taxes on that land, and more non-Indian people bought our land. Then they, then they passed the Homestead Act, which opened up our reservation land, which was supposed to be reserved for our use and occupation, but they were opened up for non-Indian settlers that were coming to the newly created state of South Dakota. So growing up on the Shrine River Indian Reservation was really different because I grew up in a setting where we had a lot of Indian people, we also had a lot of non-Indian people. But the non-Indian people were minorities. And we all went to the same school for the most part. There were different schools, but where I grew up, we grew in Eagle Butte, we all went to the same school. So Indian and white people all went to the same school. And for the most part, we got along. And I remember going to that school, and I remember because white people were that minority, they were sometimes mistreated by some of my friends. We made fun of them because they weren't like us. So it's kind of the reverse. And I remember always feeling sorry for white people until my first trip to a border town. I used to feel sorry for my white friends because my older, my, some of my Indian friends would mistreat them until my first trip to a border town. And I went to Mobridge, South Dakota. I went to a dime store. I got followed around that store until I left. And I went to the pier, to pier, South Dakota for the first time. Going to town for us was going to Mobridge and Pier. I went to Pier and I remember I couldn't go into the to the grocery store, I couldn't go to any store without being followed around the entire time. And I saw how white people treated my dad. I saw how white people treated my mother. And so I experienced racism for the first time. And then I realized, my older friends that were mistreating these white people on my reservation, I realized that it was because of the racism that we were experiencing once we left the reservation. So that was my first confrontation, but uh, there are other stories I have of it as I grew older. Uh, my understanding of racism has become much more nuanced because it's still evolving. It's not just about race with me. It's about my political affiliation, and there's a whole different layer of that. As I grew older, it's, it's not just about individual, but it's about the racism against me individually, but then against my community, and then racism against my tribe, and then racism against all tribes because of misconceptions and misunderstandings about who we are as Native people. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Novak, this next question is specifically for you. What do you feel it means to be an effective conversation about race and then continuing those effective conversations? I think it means doing probably what we're doing here tonight, but even more intentionally, I think, is inviting people into dialogue to create understanding. And so in small communities like Mitchell and in small universities like Dakota Wesleyan, we have an obligation, I think, and an opportunity to really ask questions of each other as a vehicle for achieving understanding. And so um, I think that happens most effectively sometimes when we, we just open ourselves up to it. And I have to lift up our students because I think quite frequently, whether it's around a lunch table or hanging out watching a Netflix binge in between the movies, um, there is a lot of really healthy conversation because we do have students who come from all different sorts of backgrounds and who, who are able to engage one another without pretense. And um, I think they learn from one another. I, I remember a distinct story of a parent from Chicago coming through and seeing a gun cabinet in Allen Hall. And that mother pulling me aside and saying, okay, seriously, they don't have guns on this campus, right? And it was a fear of a woman coming out of the south side of Chicago about the safety for her son on this campus. And what that did, though, was allow that young man over his four years get to know a family in Plankington, South Dakota, whose livelihood was in hunting. And 
what they learned from him and what he learned from them was just an absolutely eye-opening experience about the world. And so for us to continue to have effective conversation, it's about not being afraid to ask questions, to not being afraid to apologize for misunderstandings, and to really just actively listening to one another so that we can come to an appreciation of what it is that's shaped all of our collective experiences. And they're very different. And, um, and we don't always know what is behind everyone's door, what's, what's embedded in their soul, but as a Christian community, hopefully we can create an atmosphere that models respect and we encourage that ongoing dialogue. I know that I've said to students on numerous occasions, and I say to my own children, and there have been occasions, I think for the most part, Mitchell strives to be a very welcoming community. But there are occasions when lack of understanding, or maybe just ignorance, um, creates situations that are uncomfortable, or unjust, or maybe even unfair. And it is our responsibility to bring that to someone's attention in a civil way and just say, you know what, you might not fully understand the context or let me help you understand why that person feels that way. And um, when we can do that civilly, I think we advance our understanding of one another profoundly. Um, so I think being in effective communication and an effective conversation is listening and not being afraid to sort of shed our own barriers to reach out, as you indicate, and ask questions, and try and come to a greater understanding of who our neighbor really is. Thank you, Dr. Novak. Our next question is for Mr. Koster uh, with the Mitchell PD. We hear so much about the racial privilege and racial profiling in the news today. But in what ways have you or the Mitchell Police Department worked to make decisions that prevent or address racial, pr racial privilege in our community? I think first of all, what we try and start out with is, is to find the best officers that we can to police our community. We, we do the best we can to get qualified people to train those people and instill in them that everyone is treated equally. We have a, a, a growing diversity in Mitchell. We, you know, welcome that diversity. We try and get our officers to be involved in our community, be interactive with our community, and engage everyone in our community. Um, we hold our officers accountable. I think a big piece of preventing that type of behavior is holding officers accountable, investigating any, you know, complaints or concerns from our community. Um, you know, in, ensuring that there is no, no bias, that everyone is treated equally, whether it be race, religion, uh, ethnic background, sexual orientation. The officers know that they are to treat people as, as they would wish to be treated. Uh, we have an accountability system in, in Mitchell. Fortunately, uh, we have body cameras on all of our officers. All of our interactions with the public are recorded. Any interaction that our officers have with anyone in the community, whether it be simply someone that comes into our lobby to ask a question of an officer, all of those things are recorded so that there's, you know, should there be any questions or any concerns, we can review those types of things and, and see exactly what did and did not happen. Um, all of our patrol cars uh, have audio visual uh, recordings, again, to help as well, you know, for the enforcement actions, but to protect people's rights in case there are questions in those types of situations. Um, if there ever comes a question of racial profiling, uh, criminal conduct on behalf of our officers, we reach out to the Attorney General's office to conduct an investigation so there is no question about uh, you know, preference or uh, you know, internal pressure to come to a conclusion about something that would happen or would be you know, alleged against our officers. We want that transparency to know that we're not here to hide anything. We're not here to treat anyone you know, in, a, in a poor way. Uh, I think that's the biggest thing is just try and get that transparency and that trust of our community. Thank you. Mr. LaPlante, you mentioned briefly some of what you did um, in your position to address some of the 
racial privilege and racial understandings that in our state. Could you elaborate on what you think still needs to occur in our state or community to help address some of that racial privilege? Get the mic to work. Well, I commend uh, the chief here for the things that they're doing here locally in terms of creating transparency. And I think uh, those types of efforts need to continue. Uh, working with local communities, um, I think is really, really important. And I think there were two really important, when I was uh, working for the state, there were two really important uh, things that we did that I thought were, um, that really helped us move the ball, so to speak, um, and, um, uh, and get people talking about race. Um, but you have to be diligent. You can't just have one talk and expect that it's going to be all good or that one talk is gonna cover us. Oh, we had the talk, we can move on. It doesn't work that way. Racism is very insidious. And you know, I, I, I was always, when I first became secretary, I took a really active approach to my position. And first of all, it was fun because my role was not defined. It was defined, by, it was defined somewhat by state statute. But I got to kind of take and put my own approach to it. And for me, it was about working with local communities. It was about going out and sitting down with local community members and having these discussions on tough issues. The first community I went to was Wagner, South Dakota. Those of you with the knowledge of history between state and tribal people, Wagner had a very, very sketchy history because of the lawsuits that were filed by the city of Wagner, the county of Charles Mix against the local uh, Yankton Sioux tribe over land disputes. Uh, and um, I remember the first time we went down there and had a dialogue, um, it didn't go very well. Uh, we had one county commissioner show up, um, and those of you that are out here, I'm assuming we have a mixture of students that are political science, uh, probably a couple English majors, I don't know, some, some, some phys ed, I, I don't know where the, but I'm sure we're, you're here because you have an interest in civil and you have an interest in, in, in public service. Um, and I tell you, public service is so much fun. It doesn't pay very well, but it's a lot of fun. And some of the most exciting work I ever did in my life was the work I did as a cabinet secretary. But I remember um, the first time I went down to Wagner and we had discussions on, on race and, and community uh, divisions, one county commissioner showed up, one, two tribal members, and my facilitator, which was the dean of the law school at the time, Barry Vickery, who promised me because I, I helped him on a project when I was a law student. He said he'd repay me when I, when I, when I got out in my career. I, call, I cashed that in right away. Students, if your professors ever tell you that they're gonna help you with something, when you become a professional, make sure and call them on it. And Barry Vickery came and he facilitated our first discussion. There wasn't a lot of people there, but we spent three hours talking about culture. And we spent three hours talking about the old days, the good old days of what it used to be like back in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. And, uh, and then we started talking about current issues. And, it was so much, it was, it was meaningful, but there wasn't a lot of people there. And of course, that dialogue led to, to more dialogue on other really divisive issues, including education and law enforcement, and how we could do some cross deputization to help overcome the jurisdictional uh, quandaries that, that we're facing in that community. And I, this, this meeting is way too short for us to go into detail on that. But it was, it, it was amazing work. So you, you can't just have one conversation expect. Now, thankfully, after I had those initial meetings, there was a group down there called Horizons. My good friend Amy Doom and Vince Two Eagle are continuing the work of community dialogue on race and, and, and how we can overcome those challenges. Um, they were actually doing it before I started it, and then we kind of teamed up, and they're continuing to do it, and I go to their meetings every now and then, and I'm still an ally, you know, uh, of, their, of their movement. Um, but you ha it has to be continual. And the reason why is because you're going to have turnover when the chief resigns or retires or, you know, when he moves on and starts playing golf in about 10 years. Who's going to take his spot? 
Is that chief going to be as open to having the same community dialogue? Um, you know, and so, you know, the county commission in Charles Mix County, there's, there's turnover. There's turnover on a tribal council. There's turnover on a city council. And when that composition of those entities change, the attitudes change. You know, one of the things that struck me about Charles Mix is I, I used to think when I first got down there because some of the attitudes about race between whites and Indians was very, um, very, uh, very difficult. And I thought, wow, where am I at? Am I in South Dakota? Am I in 2011? Because some of the conversations that we had reminded me of some of the anecdotes that I would read about during the Civil Rights Movement of blacks in the South. It was just amazing to me, the attitudes that they had. And, but the thing that was amazing to me is that um, I would think, well, maybe it's just this older generation. Because I come from a place that I really believe people can change. And I believe organizations can change. And I believe states can change. And I believe societies can change. I believe in that, because I believe in the human spirit. But, you know, what really amazed me was I, would hear, I was starting to hear some of the same attitudes coming from the younger generation. So this issue of combating racism, you can't just do a once over. You gotta rinse and repeat that dude over and over and over again. Because, because racism is like a bad spirit. It's insidious and it's cunning and it knows how to creep its way back into our own hearts and into our own minds, not to mention our institutions and our social structures. So we gotta be ever vigilant and you got to have that open-ended dialogue. And so we had a lot of that as, for as much as we accomplished during uh, our time there. And I think we, we did some good things and, and we've done some good things since. Um, we got an election coming up. And so, and so it's something we have to keep on going. So to the Chief's point, you know, having some cultural education with his law enforcement officers, doing that over and over I think is important. Um, I think, I think the other thing is, from a, from a governmental perspective, um, you know, I had, one of the things that was an advantage for me when I was in my position is I had the governor's blessing. You know, you know what it's like to be able to, ha to have the governor's blessing? <laughs> to show up somewhere and say, I'm here because the governor said I could be here. It opens up some pretty, pretty big doors. And I took advantage of that. Full, I fully confess, I took advantage of that. I showed up, I showed up in places that I'm sure people did not expect me to show up. And I started dialogue on things that I'm sure people did not expect us to dialogue on. But it was because the governor blessed, gave his blessing. And so I think some of the things that we can continue to do is take a look at our laws and, and be critical of them. You know, um, what, what do we have on our books? Um, take a look at your local, um, your local, um, uh, policies, even here at the university. One of the things I'm really grateful for, for the governor, is that he used his power as a governor to appoint me as the Secretary of Tribal Relations. Some of you students out here are one day going to be in those leadership roles. And my challenge to you is that when you're in them, don't be afraid to appoint a person of color to an important role. The only way we're going to change, we're going to create diversity in this state. And by the way, we don't have it right now. That's the other thing, we've got to be honest with ourselves. Can't sit here and continue to lie and justify and rationalize. That's for the birds. We've got to be honest with ourselves. Take a look at our judiciary. How many Native Americans, African Americans, Asian Americans, Korean Americans, or people of color that sit on, our, on, the, on the bench of South Dakota? How many? Zero. There's none. How many, how many vice presidents and executives are in our major corporations in South Dakota that are of minority descent? Probably none. You know, I had, a, I had a goal for you minorities out there. I had a goal. I've always had a goal. I'm going to break ceilings. Whatever it takes to break ceilings, I'm going to break them, both ideologically and literally, because, because we have to be moving upward. Our country, our state needs a diverse perspective. That's what makes us powerful. That's what makes us strong. And, and so don't be afraid to challenge for, and apply for those positions. Those of you that are Native American in this crowd, don't just stay on the res. Leave the res. 
take a job off the res and work for the state, work for a county, work for a city. They need you. I mean, I'm, the chief can probably attest, it's hard to find good law enforcement officers. We'll take them any color, green, purple, red, blue, whatever the color you are, we'll take them because it's hard to find good law enforcement. But um, I'm so thankful for the governor appointing me because for the first time, you know, when I was a little boy and I looked at the television, guess what I didn't see? I didn't see any Native Americans on TV. And when I looked at state government, I didn't see any Native Americans in state government. The last uh, uh, congressional uh, person that we elected from our state who was Native American descent was Ben Rifle. We haven't had one since. You look at the number of Native Americans in our state legislature. By the way, I'm running for state house representative district 14 out of Sioux Falls, by the way. <laughs> but, uh, but we don't have any in, on, in, in, that are members of our legislature. We make up 10% of the population are, are that we only have four Native Americans in our state legislature. So, so I think there's still things that our government can do. Um, political appointments is one of them. The governor has the power to appoint judges. The governor has the power to appoint cabinet people. You know what I wish one day? I hope a Native American gets appointed to a non-tribal related cabinet position. I hope one day that a Native American or a person of color is our attorney general. I hope one day that we have an, uh, a minority uh, governor. You know, when I, I used to, you know, my immediate supervisor when I was in state government was Matt Michaels. How many of you guys know Matt Michaels? Who doesn't know Matt Michaels, right? Lieutenant Governor of the State of South Dakota. I used to go in and he, I'd come out of his office. One day I came out of his office. He had two doors, actually three doors. He had two doors that I used to go into his office. I went in one door, came out the other. I went in the door inside the office, but I came out the side door. And one day I came out of the side door and there were two very wonderful, pleasant, Caucasian older lady standing out in the hallway. And uh, they turned to me because I was coming out of the Lieutenant Governor's office and they looked at me and they said, they said, they looked at me and they said, oh, we thought you were the Lieutenant Governor, but you're not the Lieutenant Governor. Well, one day I hope that we have a minority person as Lieutenant Governor. See, people have expectations. Even Indian people, in, in, our, in our Indian society, we call it lateral racism. Because even our Indian people expect less of a person that's dark and long-haired like me. I want that to end someday. So appointments is, is one thing. So there's a number of practical things, and of course, again, state-sponsored events that we could do. It was Governor Mickelson that said, we need to start going to one another's cultural events. And we can learn a lot from those events. So anyway, long answer. Uh, you know, I hope this is just the beginning of the dialogue. I hope that this is just the first of many that you have. I hope you guys do this every year. Hope you guys start something that continues move, moving forward. Thank you. Thank you for all of that great insight. Uh, our last question goes to Dr. Hess. Although you are new to our community, uh, we want to ask you, what do you think communities still need to do to help prevent or address uh, racial privilege in small towns? Well, I think we have to first acknowledge that it exists, right? Like that's the very basic low minimum bar. And I think that a lot of white folk, um, we have been afraid, we have been, um, afraid to confront the fact that there's pain and loss and suffering and that it's often linked to very difficult histories. And we don't know what to do about it and so we would rather just ignore it or not think about it or excuse it. So starting with acknowledging it first, right? And I think what's, what was interesting for me is I was looking for statistics, right, to illustrate some arguments to realize that there have been some very deep issues, for instance, as I noted around incarceration, and South Dakota's working on them. Right? I mean, in the classes that I was in today, uh, talking to students, there were students sharing examples of things that they've learned, um, stories from their own families. And, you know, that maybe sounds sort of banal or trivial, right, that we should listen to each other. But I, I very much agree with the point that Mr. LaPlante was making, which is that this is an ongoing process. And the thing is, when you begin to be in relationship with each other, you can begin to be accountable to each other. And I think that that is really, learning how to be accountable to each other is sort of the next real piece in this. And racism is t very insidious. It's, it's, and it's pervasive. It, it just is, 
And it, in, doing, in, in being so pervasive and insidious, it pollutes a lot of our relationships. So the really good news, I think, especially for white folk, is that engaging it, confronting it, is, can actually be a life-giving and um, empowering experience, right? Like it's not, it's not just about somehow giving up privileges. It's about understanding um, what it is to really cherish each other and to really be in a shared community. And I think that you all can start doing that. I think some of you are already doing it. So, you know, I keep doing it. Thank you, Dr. Hess. Uh, we now have some time for some of the audience questions. Uh, the first one we have is for all of you, if you would mind sharing briefly. Uh, how have you benefited or uh, been adversely affected by uh, privilege in terms of race? You want us to just go down the table? Look at every time I walk into any kind of um, theological environment, uh, there, for the most part, there are always more white folk there than anybody else. There are, um, it, I mean, this goes back to legislature, legislatures, it's the academy, it's, I mean, it's, it is rare for me to find myself being one of only a few folk. And that has an overwhelming impact that I think we are loath to recognize, right? I think that there are things that I've learned also um, by being a woman in the academy, which is not necessarily a privileged place, and having um, been the brunt, or bearing the brunt of certain kinds of systemic oppression that way has given me deep empathy and a willingness to listen when somebody tells me about um, systems that they're embedded in. So right, I think there's something about um, learning from your own experience to give you deeper empathy for listening to somebody else's. I'm gonna do the very bad student thing. Can you just repeat the question one more time? <laughs> Don't worry, I would probably have that for most of my professors as well. Okay. Um, how have you benefited or been adversely affected by aspects of race and racial privilege? Uh, if you could share a personal story, that would be wonderful. Okay, so um, sometimes I think we just take for granted some of the assumptions we have and the opportunities we have. And um, I'm gonna just share a story through the lens of my two children who are in high school. And, um, and it's, it's not a, it's simply a reflection of the experience they have that I probably don't have. So um, my son, who's a sophomore, walked into school one day and he had his hoodie up. And um, someone came up to him and said, hey, you know, you're black, you shouldn't have your hoodie up, right? I wouldn't have ever had that encounter, and I know that. And those are just sometimes the assumptions that we make that while nobody meant any harm by that, um, they connoted a certain thing about black men who wear hoodies up, okay? So that's, that's one of the things that I've just become awakened to um, as a parent, and something I'm, I'm sensitive to thinking about and just helping um, educate others on, and I would say as well, sometimes when you're in a smaller community, you make assumptions just about black people generally. And so, for example, it's not uncommon for people to think that Mark and Samela know everything about rappers, and that they are, um, you know, they want to touch their hair, and that uh, they are going to be unbelievable NBA athletes. And Mark is, you know, struggling to five, six, and drinks milk every day, and there's probably no way in the world he's gonna be an NBA athlete. And um, so there's perceptions we have only because we don't have very many black people in Mitchell. And so if you've never had that exposure, you make assumptions. And so it's an opportunity each and every day that we have lots of kids over at our house to just have conversation and to begin to get into relationship. And so um, that's what, we f what I feel privileged about is the opportunity that that kind of dialogue and that understanding and that relationship building can happen both in my own family, at my own dinner table, with all the kids that wander through our house, and that it can also happen here at this university because our students are hopefully 
on occasion probably making difficult assumptions. There is racism that permeates it, but there's also an openness. When you're 18 to 24, there's something just about discovering who you are and learning about other people. And I appreciate the honesty and authenticity with which our students um, engage each other. That's not to say they haven't also had struggles, but they defend each other in beautiful ways. And um, so it's just been, I think sometimes a privilege to see and to be part of learning from them. Then I, I don't take that for granted. I, I really value the diversity on the campus, among our faculty. It's limited, but what we have, and certainly um, within our own family and what I've learned from that, so. I think one of the things that I've seen that's impacted me negatively in a career perspective, being in a, a, a smaller community in South Dakota that is predominantly white, in law enforcement, the negative thing that I see when I was still out on patrol, we, we would interact with people with color that sometimes, and not always, that would expect that they wouldn't be treated fairly simply because it was a, a, a white officer and a person of color. And you had to overcome that and, and prove to them in some cases that we're here to treat you fairly. Our interaction is going to be not based on your color, not based on your ethnicity. It's gonna be based on you know, the reason we're here, be it whether you're a victim, whether it be you're an offender. Your race will make no difference to us. You're going to be treated equally. And there were times that that was difficult to overcome because they had an expectation that because I was a person of color that I wasn't going to be treated equally. They felt that they were you know, going to have their rights violated. And for an officer, it becomes difficult to try and get that point across to them because it's just one more hurdle to trying to get yourself through that case, get yourself through that call that you normally wouldn't have if it was a white officer and a white victim or a white officer and a white offender. You just added one more dimension to dealing with that call and, and coming to a resolution. So I think that, I see that as my negative to that. So how, <clears throat> question is, how have I been negatively affected by white privilege? Well, first of all, <clears throat> I, I do not have white privilege, um, unfortunately. And, and uh, also, I don't have Indian privilege either. Uh, some people think that because I'm Indian, I have a lot of privileges that I have, I get a per capita payment every day, every, every month from the, my, my successful casino that makes millions of dollars every year. Um, we're not one of those tribes. Um, also, there's the misperception that the federal government uh, takes care of us and that we don't have to pay taxes. I pay taxes, <laughs> just like you, and you can see my taxes, and uh, <laughs> if you want to. And, um, but, you know, I, and uh, so, you know, I don't have Indian privilege either necessarily other than the fact that I'm very proud of my heritage and I'm very proud of my culture and I'm very proud of my traditions because they've helped us stay resilient and survive all these years. But one of the ways that I've been affected adversely by uh, somebody else's white privilege is just count up the ways. How many groups, how many nonprofits, how many people have come to my Indian reservation, just mine? I can't speak for the Ogallalas down to Pine Ridge because they're more popular than we are. But you know, when you're an Indian person growing up on the Shrine River Sioux Indian Reservation that is, shares boundaries with the, one of the, with the second poorest county in the entire United States, Zeebaw County, you get a lot of attention and you get a lot of pity. And we've had a lot of nonprofit, a lot of white, non-Indian groups that have come out to our reservation trying to save us. We've had a lot of religious organizations that have come to the reservation in an attempt to save us but they never stay, none of them, none of them stay. Their white privilege allows them to come and experience our suffering for a while and then they get to leave. They get to leave and get a doctoral dissertation out of their research. They get to leave and get a big story on CNN, some reporters have done that. People have made careers off of our demise. So my people at Cheyenne River, 
and my brothers and sisters all across Indian country, <laughs> we've experienced a lot of adversity at the hands of white privilege because nobody sticks around to really truly be an ally. I've had the privilege, just the privilege, to help a governor improve the state's relationship with our tribes. I've had the privilege to help a United States attorney improve the United States Attorney's Office with their relationship with our tribes. And now I have the privilege of helping Avera Health Systems improve their relationship with our tribes. But I've told every single one of them, I'm laying my reputation on the line. Don't do anything and don't say anything that you can't keep. Don't make any promises that you can't keep. Don't make any commitments that you can't keep. Because unlike you, I have to go back and live with those people. Those are my relatives. So whatever you do, make sure it has a lasting, sustainable effect upon that community. That's my rule. And so far, they've listened to my rule. But that's my rule. Whatever you do, it's got to have the ability to be sustained long term. Because I'm tired of people coming out to Indian country and promising and then never following through. So that would be one way I've been adversely affected. Thank you. Uh, the next question is open to anybody who'd like to answer. Some community members believe that the best way to end racism is to stop bringing it up. Um, how would you respond to someone who believes that racism is still alive because the media and in conversation, it's constantly being brought up? Anybody can start. Well, I would say that first of all, calling attention to something that already exists can in fact help to take it apart. Refusing to see it, which of course I think this is the thing that, that white privilege grants those of us who carry it, the ability to think that we don't have to think about race and if we just don't think about it, it doesn't, you know, it's gonna go away and, and calling attention to it somehow just makes it more present. Um, it's a little bit, this is where I'd say go do a Google search and look up implicit bias uh, and think about the ways in which human beings function. Um, and, and learning something, this is the other thing I would say about this, learn, learn something about the social movements in this country because there are some wonderful deep stories of resistance to racism, white people resisting racism too, right? And, and learning those stories of our forebears matters hugely. And those aren't stories that get told a lot. Those are, I mean, we don't even tell stories about racism because we're afraid to somehow talk about it. How are we gonna tell stories about people who are resisting it? And we lose in the process some really important pieces of who we are as a community. I mean, it's, it's like the quote I gave you from Serene Jones earlier. If we don't pay attention to the suffering in our midst, we're not really telling truly who we are as a people. I, I don't, um, I think that that's kind of a, um, a red herring that white people use a lot to say, well, you know, if we, didn't, if we didn't talk about it, it wouldn't be an issue and it's only those people, right? Those people meaning those African Americans or those Latinos or those native peoples or the, you know, it's their problem. They keep calling attention to it. And if they would stop calling attention to it, it wouldn't be an issue. It's an issue and it's deeply structured into our society in all sorts of, uh, housing is a really good example. Some of you, I was talking to a class this morning. Um, my father, when he got out of the Marines um, on the GI Bill, got a mortgage for a house and that low interest loan um, began to build equity and wealth for our family. There were all sorts of military veterans who were refused loans through the GI Bill and who were refused mortgages in neighborhoods because they were people of color, which meant that those families weren't able to build any kind of equity, right? Those disparities exist all across this country and it, if we don't acknowledge and, and move to work past them, it's a bleeding wound that continues to fester. 
I'm the first one to say I don't have solutions to all of this, and there are lots of different ways to think about what the policies could be, and people who talk about reparations have lots of different ways of thinking about reparations. But to not even entertain the conversation, I just think that that's turning our back on something really important. Thank you, Dr. Hess. Uh, would any other panelists like to respond to that? I, I would add. I would add that societies change, you know, um, and you know you, you you can't you can't judge what happened 50 years ago by what's happening today and and vice versa. But but that's that's why you have to. We don't know where we're going to be where we're going to all be 50 years from now. Um, this state could look a lot different 50 years from now. Some would, some would probably not want it to look very different, but, but my guess is it's going to look different. Um, and, so, and so we have to start sharpening those skills now to be able to really understand one another. And the only way you're going to do that is by, is by talking about it. I don't, I don't think that something goes away by ignoring it. You, you have to, or, or by putting your head in the sand, um, you have to really uh, confront it. And like I said, racism is one of those things that it moves, it, 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 it shape shifts, it, it, uh, it turns into different forms. Um, so be careful, because sometimes what we'd like to do with racism is not only do we not like to talk about it, but we say, oh, we're talking about it, but you, you call it something other than what it really is. Don't do that either. That's just another way of avoid t avoiding talking about it. So instead of calling something racism, we call it, oh, I don't know, cultural misunderstanding or cultural dissonance or something of that sort. We put some other tag on it to make it seem less offensive because we don't want to be uncomfortable. Some of you tonight cringed when I said the word white person. Some of you may have cringed when I said Indian person. Some of you may have cringed when I used other terms, but we just got to be, we got to be, you know, and if we make a mistake in how we talk about it, fess up to it, hey, I shouldn't have said it, okay, my bad. I, believe me, I've been to enough legislative hearings, both on the House and the Senate side and the state government. These guys, you know, especially on the House side, I remember one time we had a very, very touchy discussion about race, and one guy actually dropped the N-word. And we corrected him on it. He he learned from it. And we moved on, and they, and we got the bill passed. But 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 the thing is, is you, you know, you just keep moving forward. So um, no, it's asinine to think that this problem, if indeed we look at it as a problem, if indeed we know it exists. That's the other thing too. You're not going to talk about something if you don't acknowledge it's a problem. So here's a telltale sign: if people are taking the time to talk about racism as a problem in our state, they probably already have taken a step where they've admitted that they have a, we have a problem. How many of you guys are familiar with the 12-step program of recovery? The first step in the 12-step program of recovery is what? To admit that I'm powerless over my addiction, okay? Well, apply the 12 steps to racism in South Dakota. Some of us have to admit that we're powerless over this problem of racism and, and that we're going to need all the help we can get to overcome it. And that help is going to come from a lot of different places. It's going to come from a lot of different communities, a lot of different community members, a lot of different organizations. i tell you one thing I'll say, too. If you look at, um, and the professor's right, Professor Hess is correct when she says, look at the movements in our country. None of the movements started at the top. They all started at the community level. Thank you. Um, our next question is directed towards Dr. Hess. Uh, in what ways is modern racism and modern systemic racism uh, attributed to our modern selves, or is it more attributed to in the past, and to what extent does that role play in uh, minority problems? 
Um, I had to think about that question for a minute because I'm not entirely sure what is meant by it, but I, I would say this, that um, racism in the United States in you know the 1930s and 40s and 50s and 60s was um, sort of very brutally in your face, right? Like, like white folk could, say, could see um, kids sitting at a lunch counter and being beaten for sitting at a lunch counter. We had, you know, separate but equal schools. We had colored, colored water fountains and for whites only water fountains and all that kind of stuff. It was sort of really quote unquote blatant. And I think that the challenge right now in 2016 is that um, it's so much more pervasive and so much less, um, at least for white folk, in your face the same way. And so it's a little bit easier, so to speak, to um, ignore it or to think it's about something else or to do courses in cultural competency, right? Or to, um, I mean, I, I think si thinking systemically and thinking historically is not something we're particularly good at in the United States, which is a shame because we have actually a really rich and interesting history and I think thinking systemically is a wonderful way to really engage in critical thought. Um, but, you know, Racism now is so, I mean, I, there was a place where I talked about um, interpersonal racism, institutional racism, and structural racism. Structural racism is so deeply embedded in our systems that white folk, right, we can ignore it. We can think it's not there. We can pride ourselves on believing, for instance, that if you just work hard enough in this society, you can succeed. Well, there's all sorts of sociologists who will tell you that if you really want that to be the case, you should move to Denmark because it's not true in the United States. And the thing is, it's not true in Denmark either because they have a kind of um, understanding of the common good that's quite different. But the point is here, right, that um, we, we tell these stories, and you could see it this week in particular in the debate between our presidential candidates, we have this image that success is an individualist thing, that it's dependent on your own hard work, and that it doesn't matter where you're born or what you do, it's, it's entirely your fault if you succeed or don't. And that's not a very true tale. It's also not a very, um, it's not a very Christian one, and it's also not a very um, rich sense of actually how as a community we are interdependent and that in fact caring for each other doesn't increase dependency. I mean, that was the ideological push from the 80s, right? That if you reached out a hand to somebody and you tried to help them, you were actually hurting them by increasing their dependency. That we just, that's not true. <laughs> and we're finally starting to recognize that, that that ideological push doesn't really, it's not empirically demonstrable. So I think, you know, the challenge is really to figure out how do we tell, how do we hear each other's stories? I'm convinced that social media, like the conversation in this country about mass incarceration and about law enforcement and race, we're having this conversation now because of digital media. Because when Philando Castile can be shot in his car blocks from the seminary where I teach and his partner in the car films it, live streams it, right? Now there's a record of something that's happened that it's very hard for communities to deny exists. There have been all sorts of brokennesses in our cultures for years and years and decades and centuries and we've been able to, quote, white people, dominant folks, have been able to ignore it. Digital media makes it much harder to ignore because we can hear more stories. And if you are intentional about looking beyond your own self-enclosed spaces and listening to some of those stories, you'll begin to see systems in operation that you might want to help change. Thank you. We only have time for one last question, and uh, this one's to Amy Novak. Uh, what advice would you give to Cece, the students? Cece, can I, can, I, can I add one thing to what the professor said? Yeah. Um, the, the one thing I would caution uh, everybody on, because I'm assuming, again, this is the first of many dialogue that you're going to have on racism, but the one thing I'd say is make sure that you don't do your work in a vacuum. Make sure that you do not engage in this work without people of color, without minority people, because um, in a, if to truly um, accomplish long-lasting, permanent change in our systems, 
Um, you have to look at it from a historical lens. You have to you have to look at the transgressions that have that we've done in the past, and the impact that that has had upon uh, the people, um, uh, the minority people. Um, and so, in our state, uh, one of the things I regret as uh, as a as a cabinet secretary of tribal relations was I didn't think that we ever made we, we didn't make any strides toward and a public apology toward Native Americans. I was just telling the professor, I got a chance to be in D.C. last year for a conference, and our wonderful Pope, uh, I'm not Catholic, but he's a great guy, and uh, um, he, he, he gave, when he spoke in South America, he acknowledged the fact that when South America was inhabited by uh, Europeans, that it inflicted harm upon the indigenous populations of South America. So, he came to North America, and I was down to D.C. For, for, for work, but Senator Thune actually got me a ticket to actually go to the White House lawn and listen to, to, to the Pope. And I was, and I, and I just listened intently with bated breath, just waiting for him to make a public acknowledgement of the doctrine of discovery and its impact upon Native American people in the United States. And he never did. And I think his words were, we cannot judge the past by today's standards. And, and I think that was the, as far as he got. So, so, so um, you know, I think that we have to take that historic, um, those historical transgressions into account because those things will inform us in terms of how we're going to really move forward. And, and, and one of the steps of moving forward may be, may be, apologizing and admit, or at least admitting what happened in the past. So thank you, Cece. All right, so this last question is for Amy Novak. What advice would you give to the students in the audience as we prepare for the workforce and potentially going into communities that have more racial diversity than we've ever encountered? I think that um, regardless of where you're going to work, we're in a global culture and we're in a global world. And so in any workforce, the success depends on listening and relationship building and not making assumptions. And so whether we're part of a team that has a lot of diversity or part of a team that has limited diversity, um, I think when we go in without preconceived notions and a willingness to learn from each other and understand what are the strengths and the assets and the collective experience that we bring to the conversation, we're just going to be far more productive in our communities and in our workplaces. Um, I'm gonna build off of, of your comments a little bit in that when we look at the state of South Dakota, you're absolutely right, and we're going to be a very different looking state in 50 years, we just are. There's no, there's no doubt about the data, <laughs> you know, the, the demographics continue to change. When I look at what happened in Huron, South Dakota, and the leadership within that community from the Karen population, from the American Indian population, from the Hispanic American population, from the leadership of the school districts that came all together to say, we have an influx of new Americans to this community, and how are we going to help embrace all of these cultures? We can take lessons from, from what failed and what worked. But the most important thing is that all of those people were at the table. And so in our workplaces that are very diverse, I think the lesson that we take is how can we learn from their experiences and collectively leverage those to be a better organization. We're a better organization when we value diversity and not when we shove it under the table. And so as soon as we walk into the workplace with an appreciation that all of us, whether it's Michael or JR or Mary or whomever, have different experiences and that we're gonna open ourselves up to understanding the assets and experiences and wealth of, of knowledge they bring to the organization, we begin a very different dialogue. So I think it's part of being vulnerable, recognizing we don't know everything, and in doing that, we learn much and we make better organizations. Well, a very special thank you to our entire panel. Let's give them a round of applause. I 
I want to say thank you personally to every member on the panel for your voices and your stories and your experiences and also thank you to all of you for being here. I recognize and realize that there's a wide variety of stories here and experiences and opinions and beliefs and I am so thankful for each of you to be able to come here and just be a part of this conversation that as many of the panelists said hopefully um, and I pray is ongoing here on campus and I just appreciate all of your effort and time to be here today um, and again if you have any questions to the panelists I invite you to engage with us but thank you again for being here and hopefully we'll see you again soon thanks very much